Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I am said East Forest. This week I have a conversation with Yolanda Charles. She is someone who I heard on Charles Eisenstein's podcast and I so enjoyed the conversation. Um, I thought it would be fun to see if she wanted to kind of continue it with myself. She's had a really incredible path as a musician and just a human being in life, but she's played with Paul Weller and Hans Zimmer and Mac, uh, Mick Jagger, Robbie Williams, I mean, and many, many others. Uh, we talk about like all sorts of interesting things about music and how it relates to our path in life. And um, I did my best with the audio and she did too, but uh, we used her computer microphone sort of as a backup because the initial primary rec- recording that she was doing locally ended up not working out. But You can still hear just great, and I think you'll sink into it after just a couple minutes, and you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I do want to thank everyone who subscribes to the podcast, and of course, everyone who's given it a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. Those five-star reviews are easy to do. You can do it while I'm talking, and you can also leave a written review if you have a minute, too. So thank you so much, and you can always say hi at team at eastforest.org. Or say hi on social media, East Forest on Instagram, and East Forest Music on things like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and all that jazz. Uh, We do have, we're still like planning on trying to do some of those live East Forest ceremony concerts, but we're we're eyeing a little bit more like the spring. But we have a couple events that are being talked about that uh, people have asked me to might be a part of, so... Stay tuned to our mailing list or just go over to eastforest.org slash tour if you'd like to learn more about anything we've got going on. And thanks for enjoying the new possible release. We've got the second single is coming out. It's called Can't Fall Out of Love on April 30th. And we even uh, put out a video for the possible uh, single, well, the title track of the album that Stephen Camo made that's really cool we shot it here in my studio when he was here at the end of the year and so that just got released too you can check it out on youtube east forest music i'm about to head with rada over to eslin in big sur california this weekend we're going to be there april 23rd through 26 as part of the entheo wheel conference that they're doing it's both real world and going to be online so if you'd like to join us as part of this virtual retreat slash conference slash live stream East Forest concert ceremony. It's a lot of things. Uh, You can either go to my website or to Esalen, E-S-A-L-E-N dot org. And you can see all about this event and see if you want to join. It's a lot of amazing people who will also be presenting as part of the event, including Paul Stamets and James Fadiman, my partner, Marissa Rada Wepner, and uh, Justin Barrett is going to be there. A lot of people, a lot of, many more. And so... See what you think. And it's kind of diving in how we prepare and how we integrate and enter into spaces of ceremony. This one particularly focuses around psilocybin. So I'm about to get on a plane for the second time this year. (laughs) And uh, I'm excited, but it also feels like, you know, here we go again. But this, we're not going out of the country this time. So I'm really looking forward. I can't wait to be around that mother energy ocean of Big Sur, California. That, it's one of the most magical places on the planet, that, that land that Esalen sits on. So this could be a really cool way for you guys to uh, sort of be a part of it if you're not able to travel in person. And I can't wait to share it with you. And lastly, I just want to th- say thank you to all of our East Forest Council members on Patreon. We just did our monthly Zoom council and I get to share extras from the podcast as well as things like unreleased music and other things that I can come up with as a way of interacting together and just going deeper. So if you want to check that out, please do. Patreon.com slash East Forest. Also, if you just go to eastforest.org, scroll down on the homepage, it will be right there. Um, Yeah, that's about it for the announcements, my friends. I thank you so much for being here. Let's dive into this conversation with Yolanda Charles. Thank you so much for taking the time to dive in together. And I heard you with Charles Eisenstein 
who I've known for a very long time. And I just found myself, um, I felt very like opened and warmed by the conversation. It was something about the, the attitude of it or sort of the exploration of it. And so thank you first off for just kind of sharing your own personal story in that space and how it inspired me. Cause I'm very interested in kind of how we connect dots in our lives. And I think maybe I'll just start off okay. with sort of a big prompt. Have you ever thought about, and this is, if people haven't heard your conversation with Charles, it might be fun to go here because I'm kind of bouncing off of that. But we have, you know, this idea of destiny and then we have this idea of choice. And you look back on your life and you've had a very interesting life. And I'm sure you're thinking like, wow, like where I am now, I can look back and see all these constituent parts and choices and things that happen that sort of wove together that if any one of those things didn't weave together, it might not quite have panned out how it did. But at the same time, you made all these important choices mm -hmm. along the way. And have you ever thought about that and like how you reconcile, uh, especially when you do have things in life that are like these sort of really interesting, amazing experiences and how that lines up with like our role in it? Um, well, I hadn't really, at the time I certainly didn't. I felt that um, every opportunity that came my way or potential um, to go left or right, figuratively speaking, was always just um, something that everybody faces at different points in their life and you make a choice there and then and you don't really think much about it. You just then carry on, continue with your life and that's just what happens to everybody. But then uh, for me, especially during 2020, I had a lot of time for reflection and uh, as did we all. And um, I have been yeah. writing a uh, kind of biography as well as uh, I keep a diary. I have done since about 1990. And um, I just kind of started to see this pattern in my choices, what felt at the time to be fairly random and just you know, sometimes it was a, a considered logic-based kind of uh, choice. And then other times it was, um, I just feel like this is the right thing to do. And this pattern sort of evolved that I, I could see that there was usually um, a really kind person at the beginning of the uh, journey. Um, somebody who was being kind by just randomly sharing things uh, impromptu, just sending me mm -hmm. um, little clippings from something they saw that then they thought of me and, oh, you know, they would like this, so they'd send me a little clipping or they'd uh, invite me to read a book or I even found things, uh, you know, those sort of loose friendships, if you can call them that, on social media, you know, people who are following you. And you find on their timeline right. um, a little video or something and that was actually one of the, that was the way that I discovered Charles Eisenstein's work was uh, on Facebook, <laughs> which was just a random a video from somebody that I didn't know. I have I had the capacity mm. of followers on Facebook in on the main um, kind of identity, but I didn't have a page then, and um, so I just accepted everybody because that's what you did. It wasn't a friendship based thing at all. It was basically work for me. So if people are fans of musicians I work with and I would accept them to follow me. So I end up with this very kind of wide range of people who are not actually my friends who I've never met, um, sharing kind of random things. And a, a video um, talking about um, some of Charles' work popped up right at a point where I was reaching the you know, end, end of my tether, I just saw sort of right in the middle of, um, I was in New York, I remember I was in, in a really nice hotel in Soho. <laughs> And uh, I was I had a day off and <laughs> had met with a, yeah right the Soho <laughs> Grand <laughs> right okay really cool place to stay um, and I was just uh, looking through my Facebook and found this link to Charles uh, I think it was one that he'd actually done a commentary over there was, he wasn't on on the um, video it was just those lovely beautiful images talking about the beautiful world and I really I don't know it resonated with me you know the way that you say you hear something and it resonates with you it opens you and that was in 2017 and um I actually I, I'm a bit of a I don't know how you describe what I do but I tend to 
be led by things. So if I find something that piques my interest, Mm. um, I follow that. As soon as I get a a sense of excitement or curiosity is sparked, I never let that go. I, I, I wonder what that is. I'm always thinking, oh, that's really fantastic. That's fascinating. What's that? So I'll, I won't just watch a video. I'll look at who the author was or the narrator or, you know, the person, the director. Or I'll look at a scene that, that really struck me in a show or, or a film or video and I'll look at the actual location um, online and discover things. And it's what I've done in my life. And that was the thing that I've worked out or realised in the past year or two was my propensity or habit of being a bit of an investigator, a curiosity-led, fascinated by life kind of person. <laughs> and so when something does actually pique my curiosity, I, I, I go in. So I went in um, on Charles's work and it was a real moment of change for me because I had been very, um, I think, myopic. I'd been caught up looking at, uh, in a short-sighted way at life and I was feeling overwhelmed by all of my responsibilities um, and touring, being away from home, being mum. And I didn't really look up much at the world for about, I'd say, well, felt like ever, but I think since my childhood, really. And, yeah, I I was very caught up. I I became a mum at 25, which is quite young compared to most of my friends. And, And in the trend of today, it's not really the thing. To have uh, to start a family young, um, in my social circle it wasn't anyway, so I was one of the younger ones. I didn't have any peers before, you know, to help me along the way. And then also being a mother and working as a musician, female musician, as an instrumentalist, not an artist. Very different position. You're not, you know, you're one of the guys. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've been, in fact, we've got to come back to that. So I was having a chat with a friend today and partially because I discovered Bill Plotkin's work on your podcast, which is... Oh, really? Just, another oh. another clue? <laughs> yeah. Another He's amazing. Yeah. Parts. He describes, uh, I think he characterizes these uh, gifts as breadcrumbs, actually. As well. Really? Just, wow. But yeah. At, which when I read that, I was like, oh my God, that's me. I'm a breadcrumb person. I, like breadcrumb. <laughs> I know when to stop and not get led off the edge of the cliff, though. You know, it's just like, you know, I'm not completely into going down rabbit holes, but I do... Um, look further than my nose when it comes to things and um so Charles's work opened me up to the take really picking up where I left off just before I became um, a mother at 25 and then full-on into being a touring professional and not really having any time much from anything much else besides parenthood and my career and um I felt like I'd just kind of become awake again after having been completely led by curiosity and fascination mm. of life up to that point, and then re- rediscovering um, my, my personal love of nature and exploration in that area. That's what what began, really, was just looking at environmental stuff. And I actually started, I took a course in environmental studies at Open University. The following year, I think I started it. Um, or the year after actually but anyway yeah, I began some formal study because I left school early so I didn't have any formal education past the uh, age of 18 and um, it just fed into my absolute respect, love of life appreciation of my fellow humankind uh, not looking at my feet so much, looking up out, out to the world um, uh, and then actually what was great about all of that was just discovering that my approach and my attitude to life it actually exists within the way that I approach playing my instrument too but I didn't see the connection until I started to wow see the parallels of how tell I, me more well <laughs> yeah it's great to actually have the opportunity to talk about um music but in the context of the wider kind of my wider appreciation of life because I'm invited to speak about music and that can be either quite technical or very uh, career oriented, but not so much kind of connected to what people would call spirituality or, you know, being plugged in to other systems. And, creativity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I really do feel a connection with the way that I use music and the way music uses me um, to express myself. And I've discovered through how I now I'm able to look at my approach to music. That's a great way to communicate 
other ideas by talking about how to approach communicating with musicians, for instance, in a musical setting. So one of the things I like to talk about is, um, is ebb and flow. Is it all right to just segue into this? Because, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> there's no agenda yeah i mean but i you know i definitely wanted to i talk a lot mm. about and explore creativity and inspiration and you know just sort of a life journey and how it all intersects to me is super fascinating because i really see creativity as this essence yes. of what it means to be human yeah. for all of us and so for the ones of us who've kind of really dove in as like and made it into like a lifestyle and a career and a job um, you can start to go, f really find like all these different like, discoveries about like, mm -hmm. you know, connecting dots with other parts of your life. So I'm super interested in this idea of like how you're led in life and how those are kind of like gifts and breadcrumbs and like, mm -hmm. where does that come from? How do you connect to that? How do you, how do you dance with that? And then how it leads yeah. into music? Well, this is the thing. I think that this, this idea of separation that we see in society in a wider sense and then polarization and the them and the us kind of attitude. Um, there, there's essence of that kind of approach within music and within genres too. And I've seen this separation in, because I straddle different genres, I play some jazz, I play some pop, and I also straddle over into the classical arena through my work with Hans Zimmer and other sessions that I do. So I've worked with orchestras as well. And um, they also teach, so I work in the education field. And I see this, 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 this separation that needs to be bridged because I feel that there's a, a real um, an, a sense of um, uh, lacking of being able to tie in what makes classical music so great, work so well, into how pop music can be expressed or the way jazz has improvisational elements to it that is about communication that could be added to um, potentially to the classical world in a different way than just than a conductor etc or in pop so the, it's the genre kind of side of things I've been looking at that quite a lot and one of the things I've, I really like talking about is um, the way when I watch an orchestra or when I listen to an orchestra um, the pulse within the, the, the meter the timing is it a, an alive animal it's not a, a structure mm. a fixed structure it's a breathing and living structure and it it breathes based on dynamics the loud and the soft and on the intensity um is conveyed by that the holding back of delivering a cadence or a downbeat to, to say here is the place we've arrived at that pause beforehand that creates tension and allows a bit of drama of suspension. And then you get the release of delivering the message you were building up to and the audience is away or building up to that. That's so present in classical music. And it's, um, it's written in a lot of the times to the score. So a, a really good um, conductor will become part of the orchestra where he coaxes or she coaxes uh, a performance that is uh, reflecting the feeling of the conductor and the feeling that conductor wants to convey to an audience. And so I would imagine when I haven't seen orchestras uh, live, but I've heard them have been recorded and, and been part of the orchestra. And ideally, um, not in the situations I've been on, because we've been working to an electric click, electronic click, which is, you know, mm. brought us into a specific meter. But when it's free of that kind of restriction, um, I would imagine that an orchestra wouldn't sound the same every night because the conductor would be doing the slightly, very slightly different things and creating different uh, energies at different times. Now, that's one thing that I really um, respect, well, amongst many, in, class in classical music, which is this aliveness in the music. And this, it's not spontaneous in respect of the notes are written as they're written and it, things just play out as they've been uh, pre-designed but there is this um feeling of yeah i can't think of a better word than aliveness when i listen to a really good orchestra that's not what you normally would hear right it's like we think mm -hmm. of classical music as more rigid and predetermined mm -hmm. like i would think yeah. that more about 
really jazz or even just like a good um, modern rock or pop, like any band that's like really like listening and responding to one another versus like going through a conductor that's translating mm-hmm. it into that aliveness. So that's, you saw Hans Zimmer's work as um, classical in your mind, even I'd say it's probably spanning a few genres at once, most likely. Well, my experience um, that I'm talking about here is probably more in the classical uh-huh. um, field because with hands, we work to um, this, this uh, you know, electronic meter, the click, the silent conductor, and that's rigid, you know, that's fixed. Right. We have a certain amount of movement available in certain places, but mm-hmm. um, it's got less of the ebb and flow. It's more dynamic space, that one, as opposed to time. Mm-hmm. The time is more solid but the dynamics are, you know, more spontaneous sort of thing. But, um, yeah, so working with the classical orchestra, even hearing that, that really inspired me because I had or held maybe some of the similar the similar opinion to the one you just described, which is the idea that it's more rigid uh, in classical and more fixed, um, and maybe that you could look to other genres for more of this freedom of expression. But then I actually started to see the way that an orchestra plays, um, you know, a piece as this animal, you know, that's breathing <laughs> and it's accelerating and it's slowing down and it's all for everybody together, 80 piece, 100 piece, you know, 50 piece, whatever size orchestra, um, all unified uh, and creating this really incredible energy. I mean, really, anybody listening, if you haven't seen a live orchestra one of the good ones you know one of the really good ones get some tickets go as soon as you can and close your eyes and just immerse yourself in the music because mm. you will be uh transported mm. um somewhere and it's it's a changing if you haven't experienced it before you you really be changed by it, i think if you allow it anyway hopefully um but yeah i found uh, that approach I thought, hang on a minute we don't do that enough in pop um well, why don't and in some form in jazz too, especially now with um, there's a lot of bands that are using uh, clicks, um, so they're using a, a electronic meter. Everybody's got headphones on, or mostly we play with headphones and in-ear monitoring now, don't we? So mm-hmm. it's hard to escape this incessant dip, dock, 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 dip, <laughs> dock. <laughs> You're trying to get into it, and there's this thing just hammering your ears, you know, this electronic beeping. So. Um, I just thought, no, when I record my music with my band, I do not want a click. We're not going to use a click. We're recording it on, um, you know, software like uh, Logic or whatever and um, Pro Pro Tools. That software, you know, goes down as you put it down, but you can work to a grid um, where everything's kind of, you know, cut up into um, sections and easily manipulable, which everybody loves because it's easy to edit um, and drop in on performances, fix things, all sorts, isn't it? So um, I know that by not having a click, it would, you know, disable one of the features of using this kind of way of recording. But otherwise, if you've got your, if you've got eyes and you've got ears, you can still, you know, make changes. It's not a big deal. So, um, and that is how we used to record before. So yeah, that's uh, true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was recording records on two inch um, at studios with the analog desks because I'm a little bit older. And uh, I've watched those guys back then, mostly were guys, um, with the razor blade cutting the, the tape. Yeah, and, and if you want to punch in, it's like, okay, <laughs> let's give it a shot. And it's like, <laughs> and I, I did something to tape once a long time ago. I remember I did the whole take and they were just sort of like, so what do you think? And I was like, well, I guess it was okay. And like, all right, we're good. <laughs> it's like, that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's, I mean, we're just doing one big take and okay. <laughs> That's right. I mean, yeah. as well as tape was expensive, those reels. So you couldn't just endlessly do tape. Yeah, tape still tape. is. It's very to, expensive. Yeah. Right, right. So you had to commit. So um, I like recording digitally and I like mixing in the box, as they call it, when you mix, uh, you know, you don't use a you use all digital, basically. Uh, I don't mind all of that stuff. Um, but I did find that I wanted to use this approach of letting the music breathe with my musicians. So when we were recording one of my songs, um, I basically had most of us in the live room and the vocalist was outside so that we could avoid any, uh, um, you know, bleeding onto the the vocal track. And we recorded the whole thing live. And how we did it was there's, at the start of the song, there's no pulse at all. So it's all feeling and based on the previous um, 
rhythmic lyric um, will tell you what the next beat would be. So you just have to be listening, listening really well, because also we couldn't see vocalists either. So mm. um, it's a case of really paying attention. You get a, and I bang. That makes sense. It's one, two, three, because one and two is established where three is going to be. Yeah. But if you're waiting, you get a little and uh, bang, and you can just pause enough so that it creates this lovely tension, but it needs someone to lead that. So I was leading this pause of de- of delivering this downbeat with my body. So I've, I'm there with my bass and I'm lifting my shoulders up with the bass head stop going up a little bit. We get the first two beats, which is like an anacrusis, you know, um, uh, four and one. And instead of just hitting four and one, it would be four and watch your lander, watch your lander, one. And so you get this lovely little pause of four and bang. And that was done by us really watching each other. And I was semi-conducting, really, if you like. And um, we ended up with a recording that I just felt that there's no way we could have got that if I hadn't been thinking of the way an orchestra works, if I hadn't been really saying to the musicians, watch me, because I want to do pauses and the pauses won't be specifically in the pulse, but they will feel natural if you listen to the vocalist. And I was sort of talking to them about how to do this whole thing. And then it, it sort of expands or parallels with how to do life, really, in a way, because, you know, you can walk through life kind of marching, really, and have your predetermined steps that you may have planned based on an ambition or a course you took, or, you know, someone else's uh, predetermined or prescribed steps to take to achieve goal A, B, C, D. And you're marching away to this beat almost of doing life. And um, I've never done this, never marched to any kind of pulse according to any predetermined patterns or guidance mm-hmm. from anybody. I've, I've kind of ebbed and flowed and I've paused when I've needed to pause and then I've hit the downbeat <laughs> and then I've run when I've needed to run and then I've slowed things down again and I've kind of done life like that just waiting for the right moment listening then going and then carrying on keeping a work alert waiting for sometimes just some indication that I'm on the right path maybe it will be a feeling or just somebody reinforcing an idea and if I don't receive that kind of thing, carrying on or stopping, you know, it's like there's a whole pathway. I could discuss anything I've ever done and literally describe when I waited and when I didn't, when I made a mistake because I didn't wait or when I made a mistake because I did wait, you know, all of that. And it's about how well I read the situation each time. Mm. And um, applying that as a musician is about how well you read what is happening with the musicians, which is a little microcosm of life, if you like, for, yeah. for five minutes. I, I hear like you turned off the click track in life, in a sense, or never had it on. Right. And there's something in there about time and in sort of the rigidity of time or our ability to bend and shape time or just sort of um, not feel like there's a predetermined sense of like, how we need to move through time, whether it's fast or slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess my question to you would be, how do do you find that you learned how to to, to know when to to speed up and slow down and to follow versus to wait? Do you think that came from music or is that sort of a chicken and egg situation? It's more of an innate gift you had or was it something you cultivated? I wouldn't say I, I deliberately cultivated anything really, but I have, I'm looking at this at the moment. I mean, I can explore a little bit with you now, but it, it's not, you know, facts based at all. You know, it's right. like a, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I have a sense of my own. Um, I, I've been, you know, you know, the, uh, what's that? Um, Ian McGilchrist's book, um, The Master and His Emissary, is it? I think. You, I've heard of it, book? but I, I don't know it. Okay, so I haven't read it yet, but I was listening to a podcast of his and uh, uh, he was a guest on and I've, I've been trying to, you know, I, I read and absorb so many 
things at the moment, just everything's pouring in all at once. Sort of thing. I'm seeing a lot of parallels with the way I've, I've lived, with the way things are described uh, by others who have really studied these things, like Ian Middlecrust or Bill Plotkin. Um, and one of the things that I noticed about myself is that I've lived and express my masculinity very strongly in my work because I'm a bass player and I, I live mostly in a man's world because the music business is dominated by men, of course. And then as an instrumentalist who plays bass, I'm yeah. always, most of the time, pretty much the only girl in the band. Um, and if there are no female vocalists, then I will be the only girl in the actual whole um, group. And that puts me in this position of, of navigating that. And so I think I've really nurtured the masculine side of my character to fit in. And I don't mean masculine as in male. I mean the more masculine qualities of humanity, of human existence. But I didn't think I necessarily nurtured the more feminine side of my character. You know, um, I would actually be very aggressive and forceful in my job because it felt like the best way to establish um, a firm footing with people who might be challenging with me or I was unconfident in other ways. So I would hide that lack of confidence by mm -hmm. appearing to be strong, but really I'm quivering like jelly inside sort of thing. So I would use these kind of so-called masculine traits to sort of um, create a, a situation of comfort for myself and didn't necessarily nurture the more feminine side but the more feminine side is supposedly as i'm reading from these uh, beautiful uh, explorations by people like ian and others that uh, this is the the right side of the brain is the uh, intuitive side more so and mm. potentially discusses the feminine i suppose is that right i'm not sure um more that, i mean yeah? The, yeah the right side is thought to be the creative side the uh, versus the analytical side you know on the other right yeah. So I've always been firmly in the analytical side on this left. And um, I think, however, that despite what I think I was doing, I don't think you can suppress, repress or control whatever's supposed to happen. So if there is um, a, a, this balance of right side of brain actually kind of conducting things really, or actually inspiring the activity of the left side of the brain, then all along, despite me thinking that I was using my logic and my masculine side and all of that to navigate through life, I think all along, ultimately, the right side is supposedly really the, the actual master. And that was what was I was actually um, serving all along, which was the intuition side. Hmm. So everything that I was doing that was um, uh, to do with you know, enacting or enabling or making things come into being. That was this that was this sort of more left side of the brain, actually analysing things and making them happen. But it was being directed by my intuition. I was kind of what I'm trying to say is I was basically listening to it without realising that I was listening to it, is what I think. So that was not a, a natural cultivation. That was more of following the instructions I was being given, if you like, really well and very closely, but not really understanding the motivations, where it's coming from, or questioning anything. Just when I get this strong urge instruction, then I go into action, get it done, get the job done, <laughs> you know. And um, that that's sort of made me think of myself as um, someone who was a bit more rigid. And I probably did did a disservice to myself thinking of myself that way because actually I was serving the more intuitive ebb, ebb and flow, less living life to a click track type of uh, <laughs> life than I realized. You know? Do you do you think that's shifting now for you? Like your view of yourself as a woman in the music industry and the roles that you play. I mean, you've had so much success um, as a player. But it sounds like maybe over the last few years, um, you're bringing some kind of conscious balance into that and into like how you're approaching it with just energetically. Yeah, definitely. It's it's changed hugely. I, I even had a bit of a shock <laughs> the other day because I watched some videos of myself with my band from 2010. And that was a big moment of life changing moment situation because I just about... Um, to, to end my long-term relationship. So it was one of those big moments in your life where it's a before and after. 
mm-hmm. that year, 2010, I was watching videos from then, live performances. And at the time, I had prejudged or had always felt that they were terrible. And I really wasn't that bothered about dropping the band in a way because I felt they weren't very good and I wasn't very good and I was really down on myself about it all and I was judging it and assessing whether it was worth continuing, etc. on this kind of detached basis, not really um, remembering why I was doing it in the first place, which was because I loved it, you know, I put that aside, I didn't listen to that and I just um, listened to the, is it good enough, in a critic took over yeah. and I, I pushed it aside. Um, I watched it, literally watched some of those about what, a week ago and I watched them with fresh eyes and realised that I'd really done a, such a good job convincing myself that it wasn't good enough. I'd convinced myself that all the things, the reasons why I should quit uh, were valid and that everything that I'd thought about myself was true. And it just wasn't. And I realised, excuse me. <clears throat> so I realised that I um, am now able to see the truth of a situation more with less of me in the way, less of my problems in the way, less of my angst. Basically, I don't have those problems anymore. They're just gone. So now I can see things through eyes that are free of those prejudging, inner critic, terribly damning um, parts of my character that I had lived with up until fairly recently all my life. And I think that has allowed me to now embody being um, feminine, being female more fully. Because um, when I was young, I used to be so terrified about being accused of playing bass like a girl that I didn't want to be thought of as a female bass player. I wanted to be thought of as just a bass player because that would level the playing field and music is without um, gender, isn't it, after all? Um, Close your eyes and you don't know who's playing what kind of thing, which is true. But um, I also try to hide my body on stage and never wear feminine clothes and uh, just be... um, I, I wanted to damp, push down, hide that part of my character away from people. I didn't really want people to look at me, to be quite honest. I didn't want to be on stage. I wanted to play bass, but I didn't want to be looked at. It's not necessarily go hand in hand, you know. So um, that was all part of me trying to hide being being female in that context. I didn't enjoy it. And through a very long process, I mean, I, I didn't have a problem with being a woman. I have, you know, I got married, had kids and had boyfriends in my life, but it was just in the context of um, music. I just didn't want to, I felt that, I think I became um, affected by the way that society has and still does to a certain degree perceive women as just not as good as men in certain industries. Um, And I didn't want to be judged as not as good as a man. So the way to do that was downplay the femininity. And um, since I've kind of got out away from those things, basically, you know, I don't have a problem with dressing sexy on stage. I don't mind people calling me a female bass player. I don't mind being characterised in that way because it, it, none of it matters to me anymore, the way that other people characterise me now. Um but it took a long time to get past a lot of that stuff. And I think that my um, my connection with my feminine side is informing my music because I'm allowing it to be. I don't know what it is. I'm not really sure I could describe to you in which way it's changed my um, uh, expression, but it's just that I know that it's present now. I don't yeah. have any urge to suppress anything. I just am... Mm who I am now. Yeah, and it sounds like a long journey to get there. And I could imagine another layer to it. You know, I know how difficult it can be for any family or when you have kids and the life of uh, touring. And for yourself, that seemed to be like your main bread and butter beyond session musician. It was like being out, you know, uh, performing. And then you add that other layer of like when you're the mother, you know, and most of if the, the men, largely men out there on the road and in bands, they might be fathers, but there's another like layer of being a mother of a child. I mean, 
was that something that was just an additional like how did how did you work with that because you did go out a lot and i imagine that was challenging yeah i think that i was able to do it partially because i didn't understand motherhood back then so i was that young i think as an older woman now understanding what i do about being a mum and having had three children my last my most recent child was born in 2006 so I do understand more about motherhood and the early years are really important. Um, I think I understood it on some level, um, even though I didn't intellectually understand it. I think that intuitive knowledge is there somewhere. So I was very grief stricken a lot of the time leaving my son um, when he was very small. I didn't have huge, huge amounts of time away in blocks with my um, my first child. Um, I was really lucky that it was a few weeks here and there. Um, I had a long period away, um, which for me at the time was very long, which was six weeks when my second child was under two. And I think, yeah, she was one. Um, and she met us at the airport um, she was her dad meeting me at the airport and um she wouldn't come to me for a few seconds it really hurt really hurt and then she, i saw a little light go up in her eyes and then she just grabbed me really hard and she would not let go of me for about two days i mean i couldn't put her down for two days she understood something she understood that i was back or something and it was it was very heartbreaking um so yeah, it was very difficult. Uh, I think that if you are the only girl in the band, um, in my case anyway, I didn't want to make too much of those differences between me and the boys. So I didn't really talk about that stuff. Um, and I didn't want any special kind of uh, help for being, you know, the fact I was female because I, I was concerned, you know, that those differences would preclude further bookings later because they'd see me as a bit of a pain to ha have around on tour because there's always this extra stuff you need to have when your land is around sort of thing so I never spoke about these things you know and you know I didn't have a mobile phone when I first started touring um so you'd buy a calling card so that you could save some money on the hotel room charges you know you call a number first to mm -hmm. get yeah, yeah I remember so right okay cool <laughs> forgot about that <laughs> right 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 so uh, there was all of that going on and choosing the right time to call you had to wait in your hotel room because you couldn't use the card da, 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 da. so it was difficult to stay in touch um no video calling so i couldn't see my kids when i was away very different experience now um it's not great but it's being able to see each other is amazing with these video calls and all that um I really appreciate it, but my kids are bigger now, so it's not such a big deal. But yeah, that stuff was really tough. And the thing is that as I got older um, and started working with older men, actually, they started to offer me, um, uh, you know, these extra things because I'm a woman that I never asked for, but they just saw it as a respectful thing to do, like a, a dressing room. And I'd never been offered a dressing room separately before. I always just got changed in the corner of the room or ran to the toilets, you know. Mm -hmm. And if they were public toilets, you'd sort of try to get them, try to be getting dressed <laughs> while the punters are coming in, right? Yeah, and yeah. They, they wouldn't know you were in the band. Or if they did, then they'd try and talk to you and you're trying to put your make more worse. So you're trying to get dressed. You don't want to go in a cubicle half naked and somebody's walking just in. trying to focus. Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... I'd never asked for any of the extra stuff. But I just got on with it. You know, just had to do what you had to do. So as I got older and I was working with more mature men, they would um, just offer me these really lovely uh, uh, kind of uh, concessions, I suppose, or, um, and allow me to just have an easier time with it than I'd had previously when I kind of needed it less in a way. Yeah, but, yeah. I know how that um, goes. Right, right. So I, but I really respected it. And, and I actually... Having experienced both things, I know that uh, if any women are like I was back then, they don't want to have the differences between us made too much out of. I know that. I know what it feels like to not want any special extra things because you're female. But I have to say that I would say this more to men, that it would be nice if they would actually think about the differences and remember them 
that they exist and that could they bear them in mind a bit? Because why is the music business male dominated? You know, if, if it wasn't um, so male dominated, if it was more equal in terms of presence of women, then those um, facilities and allowances would be built into the structure mm. of the business and it wouldn't be seen as an extra thing. But it's seen as an extra thing because there's so few women in the business. And so rather than appear in this current man's world demanding things because I'm a girl, um, it would be nice if men who are thinking about hiring a female musician to just think she has periods. Maybe she needs access to facilities more often. Yes, we do, actually. And if we don't have them, we have to find a way. And it's not easy. But we don't let you guys know about that because we don't want you guys to think that we're we're difficult or a problem in the road. So we just quietly get on with figuring out how to mind, um, you know, deal with these things, deal with being a parent and being away from home yeah. and wanting to have a baby around, but everybody's a smoker and you don't want to ask people not to, you know, it's all of that stuff. It's just, it needs to be thought of by others besides us actually asking for these extra considerations and then eventually if enough women are in the business then those things will be built into the system anyway and it won't be thought of it's like the difference between making a building and building own male only toilets for instance or something like that right or only urinals where you can only stand up to pee yeah because there's no women around so you didn't think that actually you need somewhere to sit down but then a woman joins the building and then they say um excuse me i need somewhere i can pee i can't pee standing up and they go oh oh yeah right you know, it's like, it's almost like that. It's like until there are women around actually saying this is what we need, then those things won't be provided unless guys think about it in advance and provide them. So, yeah, all of that stuff. I don't know how I got on to talking about urinals, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does make you just, if you go back to try to find the sources of it and the fact that there's um, less women in the music industry and you start to wonder, you know, how much that relates to like motherhood and the things that, uh, perhaps aren't given like the the kind of they, they don't have the space that they need i mean you know some industries that's been more built in over time because it's of discrimination and protections but it's not in the music industry it's sort of the wild west of like you know you make it if you make it and so it, that can be challenging or a disadvantage it's like um, because uh you know, women get pregnant and women bear this burden, if you want to call it a burden or the gift of our society of, of bringing forth new life into the world. And then the men mm -hmm. sometimes get out there and they're like, well, you know, we can t take off in the world. And it's over many, many, many decades or hundreds of thousands of years, essentially. But here we are in the modern music business. It's created a kind of divide, particularly in the, in the live music yeah. and touring space. It has, it has. It's... um. I think having seen uh, younger women um, when I was one myself, picking up instruments, playing, learning, and then taking it to a next level, and then suddenly I'm looking around me and everybody's dropped off except me. Mm -hmm. You think, well, what happened to all of the girls? There weren't that many, but there were some. Where are they all? Why have they stopped practicing? Why have they stopped arriving at... Uh, um, these points where opportunities can be given um, because they've had responsibilities that their counterpart, male counterparts haven't had. Sometimes it's familial, sometimes it's looking after relatives. It's not always babies. Sometimes it's the responsibility of being a caregiver. Sure. Um, and that's a balance, you know, that goes into a really massively wider discussion about the, you know, what traditional roles of women in society, the way we look after our elderly, uh, you know, all sorts of things are built in there. And I think, you know, women have um, uh, shouldered the responsibility of being caregiver in so many other ways besides bearing children that um, it, it, it really does stifle what creativity women actually have access to expressing. Because it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that there's businesses, the business side of creativity can be bar a bar to us or can be bar to us because of these other things. I don't know what the answers are. I mean, I can only say that in my case, I was able to do both things, have children and be a musician because I had support 
I had my mother and my um, my partner supported me physically with their presence um, by looking after children and supporting me by championing me also and um, giving me that kind of um, support. I think without those two things, I wouldn't have had the confidence or the uh, physical support to, to do both things. There's no way I could have been a parent and taught if my um, if their dad was just not supportive of that, but mm-hmm. he was. So I was fortunate. And then also my mother was very agreeable about looking after um, the kids, wanted them to come stay. And um, again, that was a, a way in which I was supported. I think women who don't have that, they've got very little chance. Uh, uh, the only other option they have is just to be paying for help. Right. And, you know, that's not desirable. It's not loving. It's a transaction. It's not great. So if anybody wants to support any women out there and they want to see change, support the women in your life to help them do the things that they want to do so they're not um, only kind of tied to doing certain roles. Take on some jobs that you see them doing, offer to help, offer them a day off of a thing that they do so that they can go off and explore their creativity occasionally. It starts with everybody. It's not always oriented around childcare. Yes, that's a great point. Um, I also wanted to switch gears a little bit and I'm curious about your like how how do you practice or how do you see like what the edge is for you on on exploring your instrument and getting better because when you play with lots of different people and being a session player that's a really unique role and you learn a hell of a lot but you also have to be really good at what you do to be flexible and try to understand what somebody uh, wants you to do as opposed to like if you're just doing your thing like you're you're an artist. Like I'm for myself. I'm a little spoiled because I essentially get to just sort of do this one thing. <laughs> you know, I don't have to like put on the hat so much and be like, all right, how do I figure out what they how they want me to play or what kind of sound they're trying to get? Um, but I'm just curious if you've if you've come up with techniques or approaches to be that kind of flexible and open and get better at your instrument. Absolutely. Um, I learned quite. Um Absolutely. I learned quite early on that when uh, I don't bring humility into a situation, that I, I come too pre-prepared thinking I know what's required of me, that that's when I don't do the best job. And I learned that mm. um, <clears throat> quite early on when I was in my early 20s. I was working for an artist called Paul Weller. And um, I come from a different uh, scene, come from a sort of soul funk club scene in London. And Paul Weller's music is was he had various expressions of his own creativity, but he was currently at that point he was in um, a kind of British rock kind of blues phase. So you, you'd be thinking uh, small faces. Um, well, I can't even think now. It's these bands you see, they weren't bands I was raised with listening to. Cream, you'd think of Cream bands like mm. Cream. I don't know if you know these bands. Anyway, so. I um, didn't know the music very well at all, just heard them on the radio, but wasn't a, a, an avid listener, and arrived to play his music with a kind of arrogance that it wasn't as difficult to play as funk music, which is what I was playing with my friends and doing okay. And I was in two bands um, that was touring, small level, but was, you know I was earning a bit of a living. And I'd just done a TV show, and Paul Weller had seen me on this TV show playing a funk track, which was a... Um, average white band track called pick up the pieces which is not necessarily the easiest thing to play on bass and for a a newish bass player and um so he'd offered asked me to check you know join his band from seeing me in that performance and then having the jam together so then when i turned up to rehearsals i realized um that i was mistaken that the music wasn't actually easy and i put that in quotes to play it had a specific style specific touch approach um even the the way in which i approached the physical um which note i played where and where i played it on the bass needed to be taken into account to nail the right feeling Mm -hmm. so we had um a couple of moments where i felt that he wasn't very happy with how i was playing something and i could he was he didn't directly criticize me i just could feel that there was a bit of uh, satisfaction so um i kind of just went back to the drawing board almost and really I, I used that left hand. My right hand side of my brain told me that something was wrong. And my left hand side of my brain found a, a solution kind of thing, you know, <laughs> um, which was me going back and really analysing 
the heck out of what was going on in the bass part so I could figure out what I needed to do to make it more authentic to the recording itself. And so I did that. I spent an evening working quite hard on two those particular tunes. And um, when I went back into rehearsal the next day, we played through those tunes again. And I could see his face was different. He was beaming. He was happy. He was a bit more like, yeah, about it, you know. <laughs> and yep. uh, I could feel that I'd nailed it. Again, nothing was said. It was all just this kind of body language kind of communication. And I learned massive amounts from that. I learned to not think I know. Don't think you know. And that was, I think that lesson of not thinking that you know is, I think, the most precious lesson I've learned through life that I can apply to any area, really, is to not have the arrogance of predetermination or... or um, having your mind already made up or thinking you know in advance about how to do something that you have to, again, this ebb and flow thing, you have to be in the room, you have to breathe with the room, you have to see what's going on in the situation, whether it's in the song, with the person you're speaking to, with the subject matter, whatever it is, then just charge in and just like a bull in a china shop, just blah, me, 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 me. Don't do that. That's what I learned. <laughs> it was really useful. <laughs> it's a lot about expectations, mm. and also like don't don't ex- don't pretend you know where the breadcrumbs are leading. In mm. some ways, it's like uh, stay where you are, <laughs> right? Stay where you are and look, look and listen. Be quiet for a bit and just watch and see what you get told by others through their actions, their questions, or their tastes, etc. You know. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've now done that kind of experience many, many times over. And when you start working with like more and more like prominent artists that are probably quite strong personalities and really interesting individuals, whether it's, you know, Sting to uh, Michael Jackson to Hans Zimmer, all these, it's, it's, I think that would probably be maybe what people enjoy is like people who come with a lot of skill and then they're, they're so open. To like, okay, what, you know, like, what's being asked of me, or how how can I serve? How can I do this? How can I bring my gifts and do it in a way that's like trying to discover that sense of beginner's mind of like, what are we doing here? As opposed to like, hey, I do my thing. I'm here, you know. And well, you know, funny you say that, right? Because, but I that can kind of work, and I've seen it work for people. Yeah, that that kind of this is what I do. This is how I am take it or leave it. I've seen that work for people. And I I just think the mistake is when somebody advises others to do as I do. Um, I think we know when we can uh, assert our personality and character in a situation with very little mindfulness about what other people may want or not want. Maybe sometimes you have to take command and you have to be very more forceful and say, um, this is what you're getting right now. <laughs> and other times you you uh, have to be more, <clears throat> you know, gentle with it and, and allowing. And it's not necessarily prescriptive for all situations. So I don't disapprove when I, I meet these people who will come in, like, you know, very strongly saying or doing or being. But I don't know if they are always aware of how allowing I might have to be for them to actually do that and get away with it. Yeah, well, bass is a unique position too, because mm-hmm. on one hand it's very supportive, but on the other hand it's like you do have a lot of power to change the sound and and the feel. But it, it, it's in this middle ground, right? But it's not seen as like lead guitar, or you know, mm-hmm. or as the the lead vocalist. But at the same time, as you would probably know, it's like it's the foundation, but it also um, does have a lot of ability to, to shape and change how the music is forming and sounding. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm writing a kind of, I, I keep saying kind of, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed about this book that I'm writing. I'm not even sure if I'm going to put it out, but it's an autobiography, right? It's like, who are you to write an autobiography? So I'm always trying to deal with this kind of wrestle with this. What do you, who do you think you are thing? But then I think, well, you know, I'm a human being. I've got a story just like everyone else. So why not tell it? So um, in this book, I'm actually writing about that very thing right now, which is um, the role of bass 
in music and then the way that I've navigated life, I've, I see this parallel between the role of bass and my the way that I interact with others. It's not always been faithful to the way that I play bass. I've played bass consistently the same all my life, but I haven't moved through life the same way. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've, I've miscalculated um, relationships and, you know, behaved in a way that now I would look back and see that I was creating tension in others or actually um, not going to get my desired outcome because I didn't understand what was what was going on. So I, I'm not saying I haven't had this awareness all my life. You know, I've definitely um, evolved, I suppose, <laughs> graduated into into becoming more sensitive to um, how to be. But as a bass player, I have had this kind of skill of knowing my place in the music when I can be forceful, when I can be busy, when I have to be laid back, when I have to push the groove ahead, when I have to challenge the drummer's pocket to get him to move to where I am so that things sit in a slightly different place to where he usually uh, initially felt it. Um, or when I can let the drummer just do what he's got to do and I'll move to where he plays because that sense of timing that he is uh, adopting on the song is just working so great. Um, that is never a fixed position. It's never a fixed role. It's always reading the room again and seeing what has to happen to get the result that we want, which is for the music to sound as good as it possibly could. And um, that is a bass player's job a lot of the time, to be the one that figures out how to, you know, kind of influence, shall we say, the harmony by notes choice, uh, note choice, and how to influence the rhythm with the drummer inter interaction to allow this cohesion to happen between all the members, which only really works if everybody is actually listening to the bass player. So just saying to any musicians <laughs> listening right now, <laughs> listen to your bass player. <laughs> Unless your bass must, player... It must have been a trip, though, for you. I mean, aren't you? Weren't you just about contracted to play with Sting, and he's a known as a bass player? And then I'm guessing he, you're going to play the bass, and he's going to sing and play other things. Yeah, at the moment we're we're, we're talking right now, so um, you know, COVID's made everything so um, uncertain. I did sign a contract uh, at the start of 2020. We were scheduled to go out in April, um, and then it, we didn't. <laughs> because nobody did. Uh, and so we've been, all been on pause since then. I have no idea what's going to happen next. So we'll see. I'm, I'm hoping that everything goes ahead as planned. Um, but we're all, um, we're all paused and nobody knows what's happening. But yeah, that's going to be all speculative if I stop talking about that. But yeah, imagine being hired to play bass in a band with the songwriter and the bass player has hired you to play the bass yeah yeah it's like if, if if you were hired to play for like Paul McCartney or something it's like it's unique because like well he's a bass player yeah <laughs> so well, you know he's what? gonna know how you know he's, he's got an opinion it's cool though too you get you have like a unique communication about like really knowing the instrument and its role yeah I, I just I see music as music so I don't expect I'll be able to play bass like like Sting um who wants you to be you yeah yeah I want to respect the music I understand if I understand the music then it will work if I try to play bass like Sting, I'll probably fail. But if I understand the music and what the music needs, whilst respectful of the actual way that uh, Sting played all the bass parts, then it, will, then it will work fine. I mean, I've been in that position to a certain extent before with um, Paul Weller, who often would record bass on or write the bass lines <clears throat> on his own records. He used to play bass um, before um, he became a solo artist. Um, I think he was... Um, playing bass in the jam originally. That's the band he was from originally, the jam. Um, and then I think he ended up playing guitar for some reason. I can't quite remember the story. So he definitely has a bass player's ear, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Really, you know, he's a really great musician in a lot of ways, you know. And um, So I was aware that he was very aware of what the bass was doing. And he liked it. <laughs> so it was cool. <laughs> that was it. It's just like, do you like it? Yeah. If you do like it, then there's no problem. If you don't like it, then tell me how you want to change it. And I probably can because I've developed this sense, like you were saying earlier, asked earlier about figuring out how to be flexible in, in all these different situations. That story that I told you about learning what went before so that I could 
play it as best as I could close to the record. That's just one element of it. The other element of it is um, getting control over your own playing so that you know how to shift your own pocket against a pulse. So if the pulse yeah. is, yeah, if the pulse is like 120 BPM, it's going tick, tock, 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 tick away, you know, I don't even know how close that was, but I don't want to test it. Maybe I'll be spot on, you never know. <laughs> that would be sounds, great. sounds pretty close. Right. Oh yeah, you, you do EDM, right? So you know. Okay. Well, I don't do EDM, uh, uh, but yes, yeah, we're talking about this genre, uh, genreless okay. it's music. Not, yes, yeah. I do electronic it's music in addition EDM, to. Everybody. It's not EDM. Okay, it's, not. <laughs> it's not EDM. No, it's not Stevie Oki. No, or, it's not that uh, stuff. It's yeah. not commercial, but it's got a nice strong pulse in the bottom. Anyway. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I, I actually, people would probably be surprised to know that I have a click in my ear because I'm doing looping mm -hmm. and my loop setup is uh, locked into a click if I want it to be ah. and so i can i can turn it off and go free i can kind of do either or right. but i'm also very used to hearing that in my in-ears that and it is very like different than what the music is <laughs> you know like oh, it's this wow. but i'm so used to it now and i i can control its volume so sometimes i have it super 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 low or mm -hmm. i turn it off or i bring it up in a section where i'm like i need it i want it you know i need sort of like a conductor in a sense but it's so interesting, like all the things you're saying about time mm -hmm. and and about the tension and release and the aliveness that comes from essentially playing with time. Mm -hmm. And then about the pocket and how the bass and how that relates to the rhythmic elements and the melodic elements mm -hmm. too. It kind of bridges the two and how it's essentially ebbing and flowing and helping create and move the pocket, the flow. And the music's like in that flow, which is what we're all kind of looking for and even listeners like we all enjoy it when it reaches that state mm -hmm. absolutely it's in everything it's it's when things feel aligned and it can feel aligned when it's speeding up or slowing down or a little lumpy even where you might if you put it uh say music that's been played uh, recorded or whatever and you put a, a, a pulse a strict pulse alongside it you'd see that it wasn't actually strictly in time again in quotes i say those words Right. Um, but if you take that uh, pulse away, it sounds brilliant, really perfect, just like it is, but it's imperfect uh, against a measure like that. And um, I, really, I really respect uh, humanness in music. And it's one of the things that I feel is slightly missing from modern performances now. It feels that the humanness has been uh, kind of mixed out. Um, uh, we've got this awareness of our electronic overlord tick-tocking away <laughs> We're at the mercy of, of this tick-tocker and I'm not having it, you know. I'm, I'm, I like the idea of the pulse is, um, I don't know if you can hear if I do this, but the pulse is here and I want to sing, instead of I sing on here, I want to sing on here. I sing on here. And I'm still in time and the pulse is going, but I'm choosing where I put it. The pulse is there, but I don't necessarily have to pay much attention to it, just like you described the way that the pulse is going on in your ears. So you can just tap into it, um, which is actually why when the drummer, the drummer has click, unless there's moments where there's no time at all and I have to play, so I then need a guide, I don't have the click if the drummer's got the click, because sometimes the drummer is hearing the click in a slightly funny place to where I would hear it. So... I don't want to hear the click. I want to play to the drummer. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that allows the human feeling to reappear, even if the band is ultimately guided by this electronic um, master. But um, yeah, learning how to play alongside something that's fixed and you move where you play very subtly. If you were to try and measure it, it would be less than a 64th of a beat. Um, just so that it just moves ever so slightly earlier or ever so slightly later. And uh, I was trying to describe it like the, as a session player, the bass line, if we're talking about, you know, being successful and playing a lot and getting paid as well to, to live, you know, the bass line I've played the most frequently, most often that's earned me the most um, income has been eighth notes. So yeah. if the pulse is one, two, three, 
four, my bass line would be one and two and three and four and one and two. So dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the most lucrative bass line mm. any bass bass slot player's career, right? But you might think, oh, well, that's pretty boring, right? Just eight notes all night long. Wow, no way. However, um, if you add dynamic dynamics and you add time into that riff, you've now got, um, well, I wouldn't like to say a finite number, but I've definitely got 10, at least 10 different ways of playing eighth notes that's distinctly different from one to the next. And that means that it's not actually so narrow after all. And how do you do that? We, we think again about what does the music require? Does the music require an, uh, a sensation of acceleration? Do you want it to sound like it's got momentum and that it's feeling like it's speeding up while still playing to a very fixed clip, for instance, that isn't speeding up? How do you do that? You might think, okay, well, I'm going to play ahead of the beat. If I play ever so slightly ahead of the beat, it'll make things sound like it's speeding up. But actually, it's a slightly more of an illusion how, you, how it can be done. It's not the only way it can be done. Another way you can do it is to dynamically play the second eighth note, the, the one and, slightly louder, one and, ever so slightly, or beat two, louder, dynamically. So one, two, one and two. So you play the two louder. Things like that in the bass line give a sense of forward motion. And you can do that conversely as well. Or is it inversely? I mean, so you know what I mean? It's like things like that to develop that kind of left brain sort of approach again, which is where you're analysing how you do things, has given me a sense of how to shape a very simple rhythm, like an eighth note pattern, <clears throat> and turn it into a, a specific bass line with dynamics that has different notes in the bar louder than others that create a sense of time or rhythm or placement. Yeah, there you go again. It's like making choices with time, simple things that actually are pretty profound in their impact and how that bleeds yeah. in to our lives and, you know, following the breadcrumbs and being led. It's, uh, I, for me, it's easy to see all the parallels with, with music, but I think it's just mm. so beautiful. And, uh, I think for musicians and non-musicians alike, it's just sort of an interesting analogy to just kind of look at how we're, we're marching our lives and against the clock of time, the click of time, mm -hmm. and you know the the simple ways you get into the groove, and sometimes you fall out of the groove. But it doesn't mm -hmm. always take big actions to mm -hmm. play with it and to make a big impact in how it all comes together. You know, and like each of us is an instrument in a sense, like, and each one of those instruments can have a pretty big impact on the greater whole of the orchestra. Um, whether it's like feeling it or not. Mm -hmm. And so it's a cool analogy. Absolutely. I mean, one of the analogies I love is the triangle, right? So people laugh about the triangle. <laughs> they say things like, oh, they see a band like unloading for the back of a lorry or something. And they say, can I join your band? I'll play the triangle. Oh, ha, ha, right. <laughs> and then I'm just thinking, you have no idea. Do you know how, how difficult it is to play triangle really well? It's about like holding on, gripping, letting go, and then banging the uh, time at the same time. So you get a triplet kind of feeling. So it's actually got some technique involved. But the point I want to make is actually what the triangle does. It's the frequency. Now, it's a very small instrument. It cuts um, through. It cuts through. It sits in the mix. It will sit right at the top of the, the audio spectrum. Um, where you can hear it just suddenly opens up your ears because it's at the top and you can then start to hear stuff in the murkier mid-range area much more clearer because your ears suddenly it's opened to hear this top spectrum stuff and so a triangle on a track in a rhythm track has this really amazing function that actually feeds right through to your experience of listening to music and affects the mix as well, if you're doing the mixing side of things. But you look at this so-called sort of simple instrument, nondescript looking, and, you know, people sort of want to bang it and call dinner, you know, make a laugh out of it. And that realises how significant it is. And I think we need to remember that we all can function like the triangle sometimes, you know. <laughs> we can be that, that instrument in the, in the shape of things that helps to clarify 
a, you know, a situation or a conversation or a relationship by just being that added extra bit of detail that needed to happen. You know, we're not insignificant. I love it. I love it. That's a great place to wrap it up. Be the triangle in life. <laughs> great. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, taking the time. And it's great to get to know you and have a conversation. Absolutely. And I've really, um, uh, please forgive the EDM um, uh, name joking. call, but I did listen to your yeah. music and I'm going to be following you and checking you out. And I hope I get to see a live performance one day. That would be great, right? Oh my God. Yeah, I would love to. I'm hoping to make it over there. Yeah, I've never played in the UK, but it's definitely on the list. Yeah, we've got lots of dance festivals and stuff like that, and world music festivals and chill out festivals. You could fit in all three, really. You're in a great position to sort of serve many people in different, different genres. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah, lately I've been doing a lot of more um, pretty relaxed ceremony type concerts. They're quite acoustic sounding and. Um, you know, on recordings, my secret weapon has always been a live bass player. You know, that's one of the things that I'll, I'll make a recording by myself. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes adding in someone playing bass live, it's just talk about bringing the music alive. And that's, that sounds I've great. done that for many, many years. I'd love to see that. <laughs> and if you ever need a depth, just give us a call. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Amazing. Well, how can people uh, interact with you? And if you, when you, when you do finish your book, you know, how can they find it? And, and. Um, well, I have an editor, but no publisher currently. So that will be, I'm nearly done. I've got 93,000 words. Holy time, cow. Is, right. I've just a few like thousand off. So I'm nearly done. Um, so I'll be announcing that on the socials, but people can find me on Instagram, yo yo bass or uh, my SoundCloud. You can hear all my music for free on yo yo bass Charles. And my, I'm on Patreon. But I'm always looking for supporters, you know, because in this time we have very little income and everything. So that's always useful. And um, that's just under my name, Yolanda Charles. So, yeah, I'm just around just uh, um, various pl uh, platforms. Um, so, yeah, people can contact me, direct message me. I really don't mind if people do direct message me because I do answer. Um, I look forward to meeting people uh, and may come across our conversation. Cool. Well, thank you, Yolanda, and um, I hope to connect again. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. I really enjoyed it. It's so great. Thank you so much, Yolanda, for taking the time all the way from London and sharing a bit about yourself and your life story and what you've figured out. And that's really what this is all about, is all of us talking about how we walk our walk and seeing how, you know, what, what that kind of inspiration that sparks in us. This song that you're hearing in the background is called Her, the East Forest remix. It's uh, the remix I just did for Trevor Hall. I also did a remix of his song Monsoon Cloud. And this song, Her, features Emery Hall in there as well. This just came out on uh, his platform and my platform digitally, wherever you listen to music. Um, I'm pretty proud of these remixes. In the uh, We had Jake Saunders play the cello. And I just really wanted to focus it around Trevor's voice and create this kind of ethereal, mesmerizing compositions around that. So check it out in high glory, again, wherever you listen to music. It's the Monsoon Cloud East Forest remix and her featuring Emery Hall East Forest remix as well. Thank you guys again for reviewing and subscribing to the podcast, for sharing it with your friends, and for just supporting the project. I can't thank you enough to, to be in relationship together where I get to share work and you get to enjoy it and then you share back and I share. and I just love it. I, I, I couldn't be more grateful that I get to uh, do the medicine that works for myself and it gets to resonate out there and hopefully be some kind of medicine for you too in whatever way it works for you um, that's kind of a circle of gifts at its best at least I hope so but thank you for being here and thank you for listening in the meantime um, I'm heading to Esalen this weekend because we're doing an event there April 23rd through 26th I'll be performing a live stream concert and you can tune in check it out esalen.org but then I'll catch you next week for the next podcast episode God willing. Until then, keep walking your walk, friends. Don't take any shit, but if you do, do it with grace. <laughs>